All right, everybody, I'm going to bring this Health and Human Services Committee meeting to order. It is November 14th, 2023, 3.32 p.m. Uh, we are going to start today with a presentation from the Oxford House. We have with, with us Kathleen, Miss Kathleen Pat. Um, Kathleen, if you wouldn't mind taking it away. Unfortunately, Dan Almasi, our director, is stuck in traffic, but we are going to proceed with your presentation. Um, so please uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your organization. Great. So thank you very much for having me. Um, Kathleen Cockpenny, Special Projects Director with Oxford House Incorporated and um, located here in Orange County. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I presented to a few other people. I'm not entirely sure if anyone knows anything about Oxford House at this point or is this brand new information? Dan addressed it briefly with us at our last meeting, but uh, I think the committee in general was looking for a little bit more information, so. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'm just gonna review the model uh, briefly and then you know open it up for, for questions, if that's okay. All right, so um, you know, just, just backing up a little bit, um, my you know, commitment to, to supportive housing you know, began um, when I, you know, had my own addiction problem and I lived in Rockland County and, um, you know, was, was in need of, of some structure and support, even though I had a house to live in. Um, I kept returning to, to you know, uh, a place that was not conducive to, to supporting my recovery. And I, needless to say, um, kept returning to use. So I was, you know, shipped away to North Carolina where my sister lived to try to sober up and um, you know that didn't work. I landed in treatment again down there and I was introduced to this model Oxford House. I um, you know begrudgingly you know decided to you know take my counselor's advice and and attend you know the first um, visit to this Oxford House. I was really pleasantly surprised uh, to find that the house was in a nice neighborhood. It was a big house. Uh, it looked like a regular house on the block. Um, you know, what I knew of, of you know, a halfway house uh, was in a, in a city and, you know, not in a good area. And, you know, I was from uh, Rockland County and I just, I was, I didn't want to live in a place like that. So I wound up staying at this house and recovering and, um, you know, living there for 18 months. And, you know, I came back to Rockland County uh, and went back to school. And I, I worked for the Rockland Council on Alcoholism for close to 15 years. I was, you know, I am one of the first certified recovery peer advocates in the state. I, you know, developed an RCO and uh, then we got funded to open up a recovery center. And in my role at the Rockland Council and being very involved in recovery support services for all these years, I continuously was faced with this tremendous need for supportive housing. And, you know, being involved with treatment providers and other providers, uh, we all seemed to just, you know, agree that it was, it was such a need. Um, so Oxford House was, you know, established in 1975 by a few guys who were, you know, worked in Washington, D.C. and um, were in a halfway house and the halfway house was about to close. And two of them happened to be attorneys. And they decided to rent this house themselves and, and implement some structure uh, and develop this model, which we still have today over, you know, close to 15 years later uh, with the same principles, with the same uh, structure um, around, you know, this peer-based living. And, um, you know, it, it is the only evidence-based model uh, of recovery supportive housing. And since then, since that first house in 1975, Oxford House today has 3,400 houses uh, in 47 states and provides 27,000 beds for people. And we're in other countries like Canada, and Ghana, and I know we're in England. Um, the houses are available to men, women, women and children, and men and children. Um, I stayed very connected to this, to people in Oxford House and, and the model. Uh, I know that there are some houses up in Buffalo that were started by some alumni who moved up there together and 
uh, purchased some homes and then, you know, developed this um, and trained on the model. Uh, but, you know, there was nothing in anywhere else in the state. Um, one in Albany, one in Schenectady, but that was it. And um, so the problem was that there was no funding. And, um, you know, most recently with sadly this crisis and uh, opioid settlement funds, um, you know, there has been more traction around around supportive housing. Um, Oxford House got a, uh, a sum of, you know, donation from somebody who, who really wanted to see these houses um, in the area. And I was, you know, asked if I would come work for them and see what I could do to expand the model and um, left the recovery center. And I've been with Oxford House now for two years. With that initial seed money, we opened up three houses in Orange County. They're all men's houses. And we borrowed an outreach worker from New Jersey, which has close to 150 houses. Um, those houses are, are, are doing well. And uh, they became the, the model for, you know, Oasis to come look at and, um, and, and for me then to start, you know, spreading the good word that Oxford House is, is here. And um, what, what ultimately happened was um, I, I presented to, to Mid-Hudson um, commissioners and on that call, um, Orange County became very interested, Dutchess County was interested, Rockland, and and we now are have contracted with those three counties and dan uh had reached out to us and we've you know presented and um consequently uh jason from columbia county then reached out to us so so here we are uh with one of the first houses opening probably december 1st in poughkeepsie in dutchess county that contract is executed and uh, we have three more to open in Orange, and Rockland is, is coming after that. So um, all, of, all of the funding is through the opioid settlement dollars. So we're, we're um, happy that we are able to then, you know, open houses in these areas. So um, the houses are democratically run. They're financially self-supportive. And anyone who returns to use um, needs to leave. Uh, we are a, a model that um, that is, you know, it's, we're, we're, you just can't use when, when you're here. I know there's a lot of conversation around, you know, harm reduction, and uh, this model does not does not support that. We do support medicated assisted recovery, medicated assisted treatment. Um, you know, somebody's somebody's plan uh, or pathway. Um, is between them and their, you know, doctor, counselors, treatment plan. Um, so we support we support those those. But if you use your ask to leave, houses will, you know, do the best they can to get somebody back into treatment and into a safe place. And you know, maybe they can come back to the house once they're stable, but they have to leave immediately um, if they. Use. Uh, the houses, as I mentioned, are, are large homes. They're in nice neighborhoods, close to public transportation, employment opportunities, you know, recovery supports, recovery centers. And um, to qualify, you um, need to have completed an inpatient treatment program or medical detox. And you need to, you know, have withdrawal from any substances. Um, willing to work a recovery program, whatever that looks like for you. And you need an ability to pay your equal share of expenses um, and adherence to the Oxford House, you know, model and guides, guidelines. How someone is, um, can, can get into a house, there's an interview process. Uh, first, you need to fill out an application. You then fill out the interview, You uh, the application, you, call the house to set up the interview. Um, the houses have weekly meetings and the interviews are conducted on those nights. Every member is expected to be at a weekly meeting and not allowed to miss, miss those meetings unless you have you know, a good excuse. Um, it's very important. You know, there's a lot of business that happens in the house meetings and um, interviews are one of those. Um, the, the vote 
the, the acceptance needs to have 80% of the vote by the members. The members vote people in. And if accepted, the new, the new member may move in as soon as possible. There is a non-refundable move-in fee that they must pay, plus the first two weeks, two weeks of rent. Um, you know, I, I get a lot, I get asked a lot, what if somebody can't pay that? And, um, you know, I'm working with Department of Social Service to, to help with those initial fees. I have worked with um, local recovery community organizations. Friends of Recovery often has a scholarship for people um, for the first weeks just to get them in the door. Hope Not Handcuffs also provides scholarships uh, for that initial move-in fee. There's local churches that will, will support someone, family members. Um, so, so that's how that works. And um, the rent is basically, um, as I mentioned, paid weekly, and it is determined by using the viability cap calculator, dividing the number of beds with all household expenses, you know, internet, phone, cable, you know, garbage removal, oil, heat, those sorts of things. And then, you know, the houses here in Orange County, um, the rent usually range between 3,500 to 4,000 uh, for the for the number of beds we have are seven to eight and the rent is $200 a week. And so that pays the rent and the expenses. If, if somebody, you know, leaves and there's a vacancy, that's where that non-refundable fee helps pad the, um, the house. The most important thing is that, you know, the rent is paid. Uh, we wanna keep our landlords happy. We, um, there's a number of landlords. As a matter of fact, in Orange County alone, we have the same landlord for two of the houses and he's closing on another house and um, he asked us to look at it before, be, even before the closing. So um, we're good, good tenants to have. The structure of the house is a president, a secretary, a treasurer, a comptroller, chore coordinator, and a housing services rep. As I mentioned, there's weekly house meetings, there's a, a parliamentary procedure, and um, financial decisions are made there. Um, any any kind of contracts, if, if somebody um, is is displaying signs of isolation or return to use, um, maybe some relapse behavior, you know, not not really engaging. Um, you know, the the house may vote to put that person on a contract. And um, that has been really helpful for a lot of people. You know, that peer, that peer experience is, is you know, invaluable. Um, just checking in with people, how are you doing? Not only just to put people on contract, but to also, you know, highlight successes that people have. Um, so uh, as far as technical assistance is funded, the technical assistance um, I'm referring to is is an outreach worker who will come in, train on the model, um, open up the houses, look for property, market market the the model to to providers, um, support support the house until they can you know sustain themselves. And I know that there was um, you may have received some information on on funding and the contract process. And. Um, I think that, you know, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions, which I'm sure there, there are a lot, but that, that's basically, you know, where we're at. And um, to know that the, you know, the model has been tested and is evidence-based, backed by the federal government and the Surgeon General's report um, is, and, and it has been studied by DePaul University. Um, you know, makes it makes it a model that we're we're really happy to be able to bring here to to support you know those in recovery. I just want to also mention that when we think of recovery housing, we we have this um, idea that somebody should you know go from treatment or detox treatment, outpatient housing. Uh, this the Oxford House can also be for the person who may decide you know who's in recovery who may decide i'm living in an environment that's just not safe for me anymore or i'm uncomfortable i'm getting divorced or i need to go back to school 
or I lost my job and this is, you know, this, this can help me financially. Um, as long as somebody is following a pathway of recovery, supportive of the house, non-disruptive, um, they also can apply. So I think that's that's really important, especially when we talk about relapse prevention and you know the process of of recovery. Um, also, to just add, the length of stay is you know people can stay as long as they are abiding by those principles. Um, and what that what that helps with is those core members can stabilize the house. So you have all different levels of of recovery or stages of recovery, I should say. And um, that also, you know, those core members who may who may stay, you know, long long term, um, help stabilize those houses. So. Uh, that's that's basically what I have. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if Dan has arrived yet. Yep. Yes, he has. Great. Take her off. mute. We're not on mute. You're in the. That's that's this computer. <laughs> so, firstly, Dan, is there anything you'd like to contribute to this? Uh, uh, other than, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, making the time to attend this. Kathleen, hello. Nice to see hi, you Dan. again. And you thank too. you for that presentation. As you were talking, I was thinking of, you know, what questions I might ask you so that you could elaborate. But you, you did a really nice job of covering all of the, uh, you know, the talking points that I thought of. So I'd like to turn it over to the audience that we have here, if they may have anything on their mind, curiosities, the nuances of the house and things like that. Um, this, this is a big step for us. Um, it, it's one that requires an investment in, in, in funds, but I think it's a very necessary one just to set the landscape for those of you that may not be as familiar with what we have here in Columbia County is, uh, you know, we don't have a detox, we don't have a rehab, but as Kathleen said, the individuals in their process, you know, usually go to those higher levels of treatment. And when they return to their community at the moment, the choice is to go back home. However, we define that home with family, loved ones, or their own domicile where they came from their apartment or whatever space they were in. Usually those situations are not positive or productive for those individuals. So the likelihood of returning to old habits is, is extremely high. Um, we have outpatient services for individuals with substance use disorders here in Columbia County. That's the form of uh, Twin County Recovery Services, but that's just outpatient services. Usually an individual is getting clean and sober in those initial days as they return back to their community uh, need a higher level of support. We do have the Red Door men's residence uh, here on Columbia Street and also Riverside. It's equivalent in Greene County for women. Um, that has a greater level of structure to it, which is helpful, but this model would be a step down from that, which we don't currently have. So it would just add to the continuum of care in terms of uh, allowing that person to get stable, get on their feet, get solid, embrace their recovery, work their recovery, as they say, and um, just have a greater sense of stability so you avoid the process of getting clean, getting sober, potentially relapsing, and having to start all over again. That's a traumatic experience for the individual, and it's a very costly experience to the community. So, yes, this comes with a price tag, but I think it's an investment well made. Let's begin up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I just have a couple of questions. Um, so is the Oxford House model in conflict with the harm reduction model that the county currently has adopted? Well, I, I would let Kathleen speak to that. She touched on that initially. Um, I don't know if it's in direct conflict. It's a choice. Um, individuals are choosing to participate in this for themselves. So by choosing that, they're choosing something that resembles more of an abstinence model over a harm reduction. Let's remember, and Kathleen, chime in here and help me if I misspeak or anything like that, but when we're talking about this house, this is, if there's eight people living there, it's eight people's home. So if, let's right. say, uh, Commissioner Gibson and I are living there and he's practicing an abstinence-based model and I want to practice harm reduction, that could be touchy because I may be triggering him 
So I, I, right. I think, and, and Kathleen, please speak to this. I, I think Oxford has subscribed to the more abstinence-based model by default to avoid those internal conflicts of, of members of the home negatively affecting one another. Yeah. Is that fair, Kathleen? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and I, I've been hearing a lot of that and it's almost, you know, um, there seems to be this negative, you know, I, I have a feeling that it's negative, that Oxford House model is negative because it's abstinence-based. So, so to answer your question, it's not in conflict with the harm reduction model. It just is not a recovery housing model that supports that. So I don't know any other models that are currently supporting that. I agree that some people may practice, you know, harm reduction and it it's, you know, I I support that. Everyone is different. There are there are a lot of people who need and want an abstinence-based model and this is for those people. I I don't know of any other housing model that supports that. Um, and yeah, so I actually, you know, said to someone, if we're going to support that, um, then you can have actually a whole house full of people that are using, which obviously we don't want that. Um, but this model is, is strictly for for those who, who need and want to practice um, absence-based <laughs> And um, we do support, you know, medicated assisted recovery. Um, but if somebody is going to, you know, use illicit substances, they are asked to leave. I guess my only follow up question would be just thinking of somebody who is just starting their journey of recovery that might be interested in the Oxford House and wants to live in abstinence based life, like how much support is available for them without them triggering. Because it sounds like if they trigger a housemate, a housemate can put them on contract and that puts them at risk of losing their housing. If they're trying to live an abstinence-based life, it, what supports exist for them in that, that instance? So, so as Dan mentioned, this is a home. This is, an ox this is a home. What, what's going to support you know, that individual is you know, services in the community, the recovery community, if there's you know, a recovery center, recovery coaches, um, outpatient program, therapy, whatever, whatever pathway they need, the house will, um, and, and, you know, I lived in an Oxford house and there were, you know, plenty of people that are coming in right at, you know, right from rehab. And obviously there are many people, you know, myself who, you know, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't totally ready to, you know, surrender. I just knew that a day at a time I didn't want to drink. And, you know, I was supported through that by attending meetings, by, you know, keeping busy, keeping active, being driven to, you know, outpatient program. Um, so, so that peer support kind of, I just started to get better. It wasn't that I didn't want to use, I didn't lose the desire. It took, took quite some time for me to lose the desire to use, but being together, knowing that, um, you know, my life depended on me not using, you know, I was suicidal before I went into that house and um, I, I just really felt like I would die if I picked up a drug. Um, so, you know, the house supports your pathway and helps, you know, to identify maybe an area where, you know, what's going on, Kathleen? I've noticed that, you know, you're isolating in your room or, you know, and can I help you in any way? Do you want to go to the movies? Do you want to go shopping? Just, you know, just regular peer support. Um, but it's the Oxford House is not the treatment. It's the support. And it's in someone's home. It's basically a home. And I, and I also said that to someone, you know, when somebody is in early recovery and, you know, dealing with outpatient programs, medication, trying to figure things out with maybe you know a vocation or um employment there's there's a lot of stuff going on and you know just coming home to a safe environment and putting the television on 
with people who are not using and relaxing and being safe and ready for the next day is really important too. Thank you. Right, thank you. Are there any other questions from supervisors? Just one quick question for Dan, maybe more so. I did read the uh, information that they sent. They had people that work on this and there's challenges, but what's the chance of us finding a home like this in Columbia County um, uh, for rent? Uh, you know, and I, I do, I think the program is useful and I'd like to see it happen, but it, with the mar housing market we've got, um, has anybody explored that yet? I noticed that startup fee where we all scoffed at 20,000 was given a, a multiplier, right, of three. So, um, thank you, Supervisor, not for a, expressing your open interest in this model. That means a lot to me. Um, in terms of looking at prospective houses that could accommodate six to eight people, I'm not gone that far because I've been taking steps you know, slowly. <laughs> Checking it out with all of you. We have Kathleen coming today. Um, I whispered to Bob as she was presenting, that might be one of our biggest challenges right. to find that, that elusive house that will serve these people in the type of neighborhood that we need it to be, right? Which is a nice neighborhood, so that it's 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 not a triggering neighborhood. It's not around the, the block from where that individual used to cop trucks or use or whatever. Right. Um, we want to extricate them from that environment and, and create a really safe, a uh, different type of. No, environment. I think it's a great model idea. And I, just, you know, I can see there it there may being be some, a challenge to find yeah, that in Columbia County. There today. may be some complications. You know, let's not forget um, we don't have. We'll have public transportation, but it's not as robust as we would like, right? Okay. So if we were to say find a home in the more rural parts of, of the county, um, yes, Kevin. Oh, no, oh sorry. So, you know, we, we would be facing that challenge of, okay, how do we get those folks from point A to point B, their home and into where the majority of services are that they would be attending, which is right here in Hudson. So, yeah. I, I, you know, do I have an answer? No. Okay. Would I like to have that challenge and work collaboratively with Oxford and that coordinator to see if we could uh, overcome that challenge? Sure, because I think the outcome uh, is, is, is worth it. Supervisor Adams. I just um, wanted to add, I'm sorry, Supervisor Adams. No, go ahead. I can follow. I just wanted to add that, you know, um, I have been, you know, searching for a house in Dutchess County and it, it has taken a little bit um, because I'm not that familiar with the county. I am now because I've spent a lot of time circling around and, and identifying, you know, where, where treatment is, what's a good neighborhood. I've been connecting with, you know, providers over there. Um, and, and we finally, you know, found it, found a house, but it took a little bit. But I just wanted to um, let you know that you'd be very surprised um, at the houses that, you know, are constantly being opened across the country in, you know, rural Kentucky and, and Tennessee and, and, and all over the country. So I think, you know, there there is a house uh, that we could find and, um, you know, it may just take a little longer, but um, I just wanted to let you know that you know, with, with 3,600 houses or 34 plus, um, that I'm, I'm confident that, you know, that we could find a, find a good ho Oxford house. And if I may just add to that, Kathleen, I don't know if you got to this before I arrived, but at the moment there's conversation of sharing this expense between the two counties, Columbia and Green County. So technically, if we were to find a house in Columbia County, great. Uh, that would serve, if it's a men's house, for example, that would serve men from both counties. If Green County, we were able to find something there first, then vice versa. Mm -hmm. And we build from that. As one house gets full and we've reached capacity, we start to look for another home. And that's how this mushrooms. And, um, so I think you know, it would be wise and prudent to start small and grow from there. Uh, that way you don't get it works. Okay. I also so want to add that it's not exclusive to residents of your county. So there could be people from, from other counties that may apply, which, which does happen. Like me, I was from Rockland County. I applied to a house in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so so the, the funding is for the outreach staff to make sure that the houses stay open and market the houses to the local providers but it, it it's possible that you know someone from albany county or dutchess county or rockland or or new jersey may 
want to live in Columbia County and apply. So, so the and, and to, that, to that point, Kathleen, because I, I think I feel maybe the nerves, you know, uh, getting triggered here with if, if the county is going to use county dollars, their their opioid set of dollars are funded. I mean, our, our edict as providers would be to make sure that we are judicious in uh, finding the individuals that, that need this service and putting them in the house so that they get the beds. And, you know, uh, if, if we have, uh, you know, to, to meet the capacity that we have internally within the two counties, let's just say. We would yeah. still entertain one of these houses in rural areas if we could negotiate transportation. Sure. Yes, that, that could be figured out. No, and the other thing is, you may have, you may be in a situation where your beds are not completely full by the by people in the area, and somebody else comes in to keep the keep the door open and help support that. So that's that's kind of how that works. The funding is to open the houses and to fund for the um outreach workers it's not to sustain so eventually the house becomes sustainable uh, supervisor adams I'm, i apologize it's okay so i had um if I, i'm very, very much in support of this it sounds like an extraordinary program and if we were fortunate enough to have one um my concern is what is the reaction of the neighbors do the neighbors generally know that there is a rehab program in their uh neighborhood or on their street and the other one is a little more basic. Um, what about meals? Do they have communal meals or are they responsible for their own meals? How does food food and laundry work? So so to answer the first question, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you earlier and uh, you were waiting. Um, so to, as far as the, you know, not in my backyard, the NIMBY um, yeah. issues, we, we try to, you know, find houses in, in areas that um, have most likely the least amount of negative feedback in the community. So, you know, if I get a house for rent in, in a neighborhood that has a lot of kids running around and, you know, moms, and babies or dads, I, I probably would steer away from that. So you're selective in your, in your choices. Yeah. However, um, given the nature of what we're dealing with with the crisis and the amount of families that have been affected, um, I have just received very positive, positive feedback from all communities that we are there. It's it's important to know that the people in the Oxford House and and again, it is it's a recovery housing model. It's not treatment. It's not rehab. Um, it's it's a home for people in recovery, and um, there's no tolerance for active use. So um, that sends you know a message that um, we expect that the, the men in the house or the women in the house are going to be you know good neighbors, and um, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of people in, in the community who are actively using and maybe neighbors. So, so that's to answer that question. Um, and the, as far as needs are concerned, everybody is responsible for their own food, but you'll often see where somebody decides to make, you know, a lasagna and invites everyone. To have, you know, they, may, they may pick a pizza night, they may, um, do a barbecue. So it's not that they have to eat together, but often it, it does kind of happen organically. I do have an idea for um, how sourcing a house if we get to that point. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I have an idea. Uh, this is more for Dan for sourcing a house um, in the event we get to that point. For sourcing a location. So the, the cost um, is split up amongst the housemates, correct? When I say cost, I mean um, overhead, basically, you know, right. electric, internet, all of that. Mm -hmm. So the cost to the county or counties is for staffing. Mm -hmm. And, and for the staffing, I assume, would be based on how large the house is, how many individuals are in the home before you could come up with an, an actual cost analysis for what it would cost the county, correct? No, they do. So the staff... Yeah, I, I apologize. <clears throat> there is a full 
Yeah, so, so the staff is responsible for opening the houses and training on the model. So the staff is not necessarily uh, responsible for, for each individual resident. So as far as the number is concerned, it's, it's the group. And, and the staff trains on the model and, and make sure that, um, you know, the marketing of the house, that the house is on track with, the, with their bills and um, filling their beds. The outreach worker will be marketing. Eventually what happens um, is when you have three or more houses in, in an area, they develop a chapter. And, and then an association. So, so this whole, it just starts to snowball and, and this will become um, their own independent uh, community basically. Um, so, you know, we're, we're starting with one or two houses, but that's what happens for us. I mean, New Jersey has 16 chapters and um, the chapters then support the houses. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into into how that works, but the staff is to, um, to you know, train on the model and ensure that that the house has become then independent. Is there anyone in residence from any staff person in residence? It doesn't sound like it. We have that in Orange County. Okay, in Orange County, you do. Yes. So that would be a potential staff cost is if someone were to live on site. Yes. All right, any further questions for Kathleen or Dan? Well, I have a resident who has a son in one of these uh, situations out of state, but he said it's a phenomenal experience for the young man. And, you know, it sounds like it's great all the way around. I, I mean, I support it. I don't know if you're looking for an action today as far as a motion of support. I, I'd love one, but I don't want to put pressure on the, on the group. So I know this is our last meeting uh, other than the emergency meeting, which is sometimes often in December. I, I would be fine waiting until January to allow people to sit with this, think about it, process it. If they have additional questions for me, I'd be happy to entertain them. If they have additional uh, questions for Kathleen, uh, I'm sure Kelly can send out Kathleen's contact information and communications can occur that way. So we don't need to hurry this. Um, but uh, it would be nice to move on it eventually. So it sounds like there's interest, curiosity, support. So I'm, I'm pleased with that at this point. And, and thank you very much. Um, it, the model really speaks for itself. And, um, you know, the the amount of people, uh, it's, it's actually, I'm not even going to say it, but I think it's close to a million people that have been through Oxford houses. Um, I, I did want to just add, and I know that um, Jonathan, who's the um, Jonathan Gildhart, who's the development and contracts uh, manager of Oxford House Incorporated, um, was was in touch with um, maybe you, Dan, and and Jeffrey. Um, but but where where Oxford House is currently right now. Um, is that they're asking any any counties uh, to to wait until the spring and to revisit um, a contract because what starts to happen is these small county contracts tend to um, put strain on the central office. So so generally how it works is there's a state council, but because of the settlement dollars, there's a lot of counties are coming in, which means then we have to find more staff. Anybody who works for Oxford House is an alumni. Uh, we just found an outreach worker um, who was willing to come up to Dutchess County. She's actually driving from Florida of all times to the cold winter in New York mm. to work in Dutchess County. Um, but so, so that's the process. I know that Sullivan County was very interested in having us. Um, so, so we're basically just asking people, let us, let us, um, or counties, let us get these three contracts with Orange, Duchess, and Rockland going, and um, we'll revisit um, you, Dan, and and uh, Columbia and Green County in you know late winter, early spring. So. That's helpful to know, Kathleen, in terms of timing. It's a nice problem for you guys to have. I can understand the logistics. You're, you're getting inundated as, as, as the counties get the uh, opioid settlement dollars. Many of them are looking at you guys as a solution and they're knocking on your door. That yeah. being said, 
you may have your own challenges with recruiting these coordinators and such to meet the need. Um, but uh, we will definitely, you know, get back in touch with you in, in, as we said, late winter, early spring. And that might give us a chance here to really figure out what we're going to do. Either Columbia is going to pave their own way with this, or we're going to partner with Green because I did have an opportunity to speak to my counterpart, Jason Fredenberg, and, and he said that, uh, you know, his, his county administrator was, was maybe, uh, is aware of the offer to partner, but was also maybe thinking about something else. So there's, there's more information that has to unfold mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in the meantime, I did want to let you know um, that we are opening up the uh, a men's house in Duchess, and we have the three in Orange, and I'm looking at a women's house for Orange County. So, um, if you know, if you had somebody that that needed the model, um, you know, you can give me a call, and and once once we open those, I'll, I'll keep you informed on on what's happening. And you know, this this does take takes a village, right? So you know, knowing that there's there's something in the area. Um, to save somebody's life is important. Terrific. Well, I'll, I'll pass that along, Kathleen, to the folks that run the Red Door and Riverside in, in yeah. terms of our outpatient substance abuse provider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Miss Cat. With that being said, we're going to move on uh, to the next thank portion you. of this meeting. Uh, Department Thanks of Social Services. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Commissioner Gibson. Hold on. Now. I got to get a hold of Thank you, Chairman. Um, oh, I do, do you want to start with the other? No, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait till you're ready. That's all right. Go ahead. I'll pull it up while you're. Um, if I did, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, I did want to give uh, David Rosetti a chance to address the committee. Uh, we've been working, as you all know, on trying to help the, the youth clubhouse relocate. Um, that's an ongoing endeavor, but uh, uh, in an attempt for an update, uh, Mr. Rosetti, uh, we'd like to address the committee. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me two minutes, five minutes. Um, I first and foremost want to extend an apology to everyone about the meeting that occurred last Wednesday. Um, I was not aware that some of my staff were going to be present. Um, so they showed up and were in their terms advocating, but their behavior was not something that I would have condemned. So I first wanted to apologize um, for the scene that was made at your uh, meeting last Wednesday. Um, I think that since then there's been a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, um, and as I met with Commissioner Gibson, we're looking at this not, and, and I don't, I don't even like the word eviction because I don't feel like Galvin is evicting us. I don't think that they're doing anything wrong um, to MHA, to the clubhouse. We went into that agreement knowing that it was a six month lease. And then from that point forward, it was month to month. And that at some point, we were going to have to vacate the building. Um, we got a year and a half. It was a great year and a half. But with their help, with Commissioner Gibson's help, I believe we're going to move into a space on state. And I always get this wrong. I want to say fifth but I'm usually using the wrong number. Um, and everyone in the community has been very helpful to keep us as close to downtown Hudson um, as possible. I just felt it was important for me to come and be present and share with you my expression of an apology. Um, and also that we are working very hard to keep the clubhouse and to keep those kids as close to downtown Hudson as possible. And we're doing that with the community's support. And I thank you for that. And that's really all I wanted to say. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> if I can just add to that. Um, yeah, we're, we're certainly on part of a larger committee. Um, 
Uh, so there's several people involved in that process. Um, and we hope to have land on a, a possible solution. I know things are being worked out uh, and talked about. There's um, They're moving pods yeah. next week, I guess, Yeah, for us to vacate 11 Warren Street to put the supplies in a pod. And Galvin is helping us with that. Um, so that you guys can move forward with the business at hand with that building. Yeah, the, the, I think that's correct as well. And, and so um, our committee is certainly hopeful that we've landed on a spot. I, I know things have to be worked out there. Um, and we, we, won't, uh, we won't relent until it's, it's, it's successfully uh, transferred over to what we would call a near-term solution, and I know there's going to be a long-term solution to better craft something for the uh, um, youth clubhouse, which is important to all of us. Yeah, so, so I want to reiterate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And those who spoke were advocating. They were passionate in their advocacy. Exactly. Right? <laughs> you got Passion is a good word. Un understandably. <laughs> well, thank you very much, David. We really appreciate thank that. You. I have to go to a board meeting. <laughs> Thanks again, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob, we want to thank you. I think you trusted all along as you were contesting on this and helping those people. So that was great. Well, we're certainly helping. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to come yeah. up with solutions, and a lot of people are, including yeah. uh, supervisors uh, Adams and Scalera, director uh, yeah. Grandinetti. So it's a, you know, we'll keep going until we find something. Right. Um, I just I thought it would be better for the for the MHA themselves to yes. give us an update. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, and as far as my agenda, it's, it should be very brief tonight. Um, I, I, I went to the point one, or I participated in point one for a couple of um, uh, position requests. One is to fill a case supervisor grade B position. Move it. And Second. that fills there. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. And to fill one senior casework position and any backfills created there from. Move it. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, and as, a, as an update, um, I, I can report to the committee that my code blue budget, which would include renovation money uh, for a warming center, has been approved. Uh, so I am now working with community partners to see if I can staff that through the winter, uh, seven days a week. Um, we're making progress. Uh, <coughs> Mental Health Association is another partner in that endeavor. We're close. Um, I, I would expect that before we meet again as a committee, uh, barring any emergency, we may well have uh, we may well have a solution on that score, and if we do, I'll make sure I, I, I inform the board, and that can go out to each and all the supervisors, um, and we'll keep you updated on that. But uh, we're we're excited about that as well. And that's going to be seven nights a week, possibly over. It is it's terrific. It is. It is. So um, with with you know open open meals also to the community and um, some alternatives alternative locations to spend time particularly in the winter that aren't outside in the cold um, but are rather inside um, with with uh, some activity and, and the like so. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're much closer. Funding is always a big part of that, and we have a we have a, a, a green light from the state. So, is there are there any questions with any? Of this? Right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Director Grandin, do you have anything to add? Or that's no, thank you. Oh, that took care of it. All right, terrific. Uh, then next up, um, public health. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, how are you? Good. How's everybody? Good. How are you? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Still didn't bring shots for us all. Shots? 
Oh, what kind of show? I just got that. That was my question. You and Brenda, I don't know. People perked up really quick. There. Oh, <laughs> got a kindred spirit right here. No, not today. Oh, no. You're going to have to come to us for that, unfortunately. Um, uh, my first request uh, is for authorization to transfer funds for CPSE expenses. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. My second request is for authorization to contract with R. Mark Hilton, Speech Pathology, and St. Anne's Institute for Early Intervention and Preschool Services. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Do you want to go to the conference? Yes, there is a conference request in here for the Preparedness Summit um, in Cleveland, Ohio. We're sending our emergency preparedness specialist. Move it. Do I have a second? Going once for Cleveland. <laughs> so this is the national one. <laughs> That's why it's not in Saratoga. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Carried. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've had several uh, COVID outbreaks at long-term care facilities. Um, unfortunately, we've had a couple deaths in October. We had four deaths in October. Um, many of those people were um, of advanced age, lots of comorbidities, and not as vaccinated as they could have been. Um, some just primary series, some um, one booster, um, but when someone's you know has lots of comorbidities, they're they're able to get many more boosters than these people have, um, unfortunately. Uh, we had those big days like the 20th and the 31st. Those were days that we received reports from surveillance testing from long-term term, term care facilities. Um, many of those have resolved. We got so many cases, not because people were symptomatic, but, but because nursing homes were doing surveillance testing, um, which is exactly what we'd like to see them do um, in those cases. Just so, you know, we're aware of all the um, infections, um, whether they're symptomatic or not. And again, four deaths for October. Wastewater surveillance um, is detected, so 10 to 50 cases per 100,000 people. But again, that's just looking at the city of Hudson. So in reality, that's detecting not many cases. Um, but again, something that we're watching, hoping that we're going to get uh, a larger sampling area in the next, um, you know, not sure of a timeline for that, but soon hopefully better picture um, and that's more the same we had one positive raccoon uh for rabies we did several rabies uh post exposure series um well that's normal this time of year uh, hopefully slowing down environmental health, 13 sewage applications. Again, that's probably going to be slowing down here as it gets colder. Um, vaccinations, we had 510 non-COVID vaccinations administered in October. That is a large number for us. Um, some flu, we're seeing a lot of children uh, come to us who uh, would be excluded from school otherwise. Um, states back to doing some of their auditing. Mm -hmm. um, post pandemic. Uh, so we're getting, you know, kind of emergency situations that these kids need to get at least a schedule of what to get back on um, track in order to be we'll in school. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we've had 132 doses of COVID-19 administered at two pods. Um, those were on the same day. Uh, it was a little bit crazy. We're having another uh, COVID-19 vaccination pod this week um, at AB Shop Firehouse. The registration is available on our website and our social media. Um, and again, we will have to, uh, we only accept certain insurances, unfortunately. So we'll have to um, keep an eye on that as well. Uh, preschool and early intervention, there was a meeting at Taconic Hills about starting a daycare and special education class. Um, our director of children and special health care needs attended to answer questions. Um, we'll see where that goes. It seems promising. That would be a great resource in the uh, community. Um, the Ichabod Crane School District had six preschool children that um, when that uh, uh, when that had to close quite abruptly. Uh, five of the six children were um, 
found alternative placement. Um, referrals are increasing again, but our team is um, solid. Unlike last time, we, were, we had a couple people who were newer and learning, but um, now we're, we're in a really good place, uh, you know, even if our referrals are increasing. Your director is the one that's retired. Yes. I think Claire had a question as to whether you've been ever has it been advertised? Uh, we're, we're, so we're advertising in December. We start promoting um, widely. Um, we've been I've had uh, our director kind of putting out dealers to her uh, network, um, uh, but we are going to be promoting that widely um, coming up. Why was the classroom closed? It sounds like that's pretty good participation, right? Uh, so it was the school district's decision to close that classroom. I am not privy to the exact details of why it was closed so abruptly. Um, but uh, luckily, all those children were five of the six children were um, on alternatives. My only other question is, does the, the new vaccines monovalent, and I see the new variant has a different prefix, mm -hmm. does the new vaccine protect against the new FL variant? The one that we got out most prominently right now, it does protect against. Okay, it is an XBB. XB. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. It's the one from the UK that, you know, we're not quite seeing yet um, that could evade both vaccine um, immunity and previous infection immunity. Um, that's that's Supervisor Adams? I just wondered if you'd been able to access the Moderna uh, vaccine. Have you gotten through that paperwork? So we're working, so not directly with Moderna because it was just, uh, it was not working out. Um, but we are, uh, we have our, our immunization network with our surrounding counties. Albany County uh, found themselves in um, possession of some uh, excess Moderna. So we are working with them to try to uh, take that off their hands for them. So that will be, um, Moderna is just a lot easier on the handling side of things. Does it need the deep freeze and last a lot longer? Um, then Pfizer, we do have some Pfizer left over from our first purchase. Um, and we'll use some of that uh, because we did have children start the series and you know we're gonna offer that to children to continue just because most parents will probably feel more comfortable with that. Um, but you know, we'll have Moderna um, hopefully this week, uh, but I can't, I can't promise um, that will materialize that quickly. All right, any further reporting? Um, I think that should be everything. Yeah, any questions? Questions, guys? Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, thank Thanks. you. All righty then, up next, Mr. McDonald, Office of the Agent. Victoria, do you have a body card? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. Afternoon, Coach. Yes. Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Okay, I've got two resolutions. Um, the first is to seek authorization to contract with BNS Choice to provide home delivered meals to their clients. They have approximately 12, 15 clients in the county. They had been getting their meals. I don't know where they were getting the meals from before, but uh, it didn't work out and they want to contract with us. We've already been doing it. Uh, we just haven't agreed upon a price yet, and uh, either way, it's going to be more uh, more money for the county. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And my second resolution is uh, authorization to renew contracts with various providers that we had to do this year. Aye. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Okay, that's all I have, unless somebody has any questions. Just, just a record, uh, our HEAP is on a record pace, our HEAP applications. Um, there's people coming in left and right, but we're trying to keep up with them. Uh, we've had to have some of our staff stay overtime to, to get them done, but they're getting them done. Right now, we're 
they processed 432 of them so far, which is quite a bit more than this time last year. I don't know if BSS is going through the same thing. I assume they are, um, but uh, you know, we're handling it. We're getting them done. So we did get something from one of our utility companies promising a 40 percent reduction in some of the wintertime heating expenses that may have been through propane. Electricity supply. And there was, uh, well, there was an additional grid natural gas thing, pipe, pipe, you know, this was our that. Nice, uh, yes, I don't know, but we don't have any people on natural gas. Yeah, no, I don't know if that propane. applies to us. Yeah. Maybe it applies to propane. No. I'm propane. thinking too that the re well, I should, you know, I know times are hard, but uh, they've upped the, the limits too. So now, right. you know, more people are eligible that weren't last year. Mm -hmm. so, and we still have some money left over from. Uh, if you recall last year, Home for the Age gave us a portion amount of money to try to service people who fell under the guidelines here, you know, just were just over the guidelines. So we've still got some money left and we're still, you know, helping people out with that too. So um, Very nice. we should be okay. Very nice. Any more questions for Mr. McDonald? No, but I just wanted to thank him for the service that he provides at the home center. Um, Thank you. I appreciate yeah, really, it. If, if, you know, my mom received meals on Wheels for years if you know, COVID struck and she was half bound and they were there. And everybody and us. everybody remembers her. Yeah, they, <laughs> and I think, I think Supervisor Gordon had asked us for a compendium that we could post on our municipal website. Yeah. Yeah. Advertising just everything you do. And it was really just, you know, like if, if, if she didn't answer the door right away or if she's out, they, I mean, we would, we, they would call us if somebody forgot yeah. to call yeah. Very, very involved in the care mm -hmm. and what's going on in, on the other side of that door for the people that they bring service to. Yeah, and the food Thank you. I'll pass that along. Yeah, to it was sure. wonderful. Appreciate Kevin, hearing yeah. that. Yeah. Was thank you. Thank you. Very All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Up again, Director Armasi. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Just as short as possible. A couple of uh, financial resolutions and then several general resolutions. Um, the first financial resolution has to do with uh, moving money uh, amongst accounts to uh, basically uh, cover shortfalls. Uh, this has been gone over with the controller's office and uh, we have your support on these moves. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best vote of confidence I've seen. I'll move it. Thank you. Let's get that guy at the and poker table. Yeah. Further discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, Garrett. Jim smiled, so I figured that was good. Yeah. yeah. He didn't shake his head no. So, <laughs> uh, so this next <laughs> resolution, <laughs> uh, I'll remember that, um, has to do with the county contracts. So I ask you again for your support going forward into 2024 to continue these contracts with uh, several local well, providers. <laughs> Second. Further discussion? Are they pretty much still on track with the same or have they? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't remember. Thank you. Aye. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. You know, you are very good in supporting Columbia Pathways to Recovery for, mm -hmm. you know, some of their housing. Is that something that could still be possibly continued next year? Or well, um, to elaborate, I've had conversations with their director who has reached out to me. Um, I, I, uh, we're, we're seeing what we can what we can offer them in terms of assistance. I don't know how much money I'll be getting in opioid abatement money as the local governmental unit yet. Um, we know what the county has received in opioid settlement dollars, but. Uh, the Office of Addiction Services and Supports has created a very confusing algorithm that they can't even figure out. I believe I've said that here before. <laughs> so I, I've asked them repeatedly, how much money are you going to give me in the form of these opioid abatement dollars is what they're calling. Uh, previously for 2022 and 2023, they gave the Columbia County LGU 283,000 for those two years. But I need to know how much I'm going to have for 2024. Supposedly, I will know in November, but November is growing to a close quite mm -hmm. quickly. So once I know that number, because other people have come knocking already for that money, uh, so I, I just need to, I don't want to overpromise. Then you need to put you on the spot. No problem. <laughs> Happy to speak to it. Um, All right. Okay, so we have general resolutions now, the first of which is... Uh, 
to continue our collaboration with Dr. Jeremy Vos. He does 730 examinations for us. Those are the competency examinations that are required when uh, uh, a court or uh, the district attorney or the public defender's office orders a 730 examination to determine whether the person can participate in their own defense. Mm -hmm. Second. 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 Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, this next one is having to do with a recruiter. We just want to close in. We want to maintain that relationship. So we're renewing the contract. Mm -hmm. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Next resolution is with regard to Dr. Carlos Valle, our lead medical consultant. He's board certified adult and children's psychiatrist. And we definitely need to continue our relationship with him. Uh, at some of 17 hours or 17 and a half hours, something like that per week. Um, so I ask for your support in that resolution. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, this is a, a, a standing relationship that we have with CCSI. They're a consultant out of our Buffalo or Rochester. We use them to get consultation on the latest regulatory issues, um, things with our EHR, things like that. It's very valuable to us at the Department of Human Services to have this ability to consult. They consult with uh, numerous behavioral health providers similar to us throughout the state. So they're, they're, they're the experts. It's valuable. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Um, this next one is a recruiter as well. Uh, which one is this one? Jackson. Jackson and Coker, yep. Yeah. Move it. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. The next one is pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's an outfit known as uh, FCS, a recruiter. Um, we just want the contract to be alive so that if we need to tap into it, the more the merrier uh, should we have a need in terms of them trying to help us find a Move it. Second. staff person. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. Mm -hmm. Even though we have to pay people, then we have to pay people to find them to come to work. Yeah. Yeah. In some instances, yeah. It's, it's a world. Uh, 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 I'm not criticizing you. It's ironic. I, I appreciate you pointing out what, what we could call the absurdity of it. But yes, that, that is, especially when it comes to prescribers, especially, you know, we have the civil service mechanism for the clinical staff, like social workers and such, but prescribers are more elusive than ever. Nowadays, it's it's very challenging. Um, so where are we at? Uh, this next one, uh, right, Bonadeo uh, is, uh, again, a valuable resource to us in terms of helping us with our finances, our billing, uh, providing consultation support, um, uh, on around CFRs, these are the reports that uh, uh, the providers uh, in the community and nonprofits submit to the local governmental unit in terms of how they've used the state aid that they've received through the local governmental unit. Uh, it's a process. So having their expertise is very helpful to us. We backed this contract down considerably compared to where it was. I mean, they used to do our billing years ago. Right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. And uh, then the last one, ha again, has to do with the, the 730 examinations. Uh, so again, you know, we, we perform those, we do those on behalf of the uh, of the county. So I ask you for your support in regard to this particular resolution. How long do we charge for that? I uh, know we, we get, well, defined, defined charge. We, we get- So you say you do it for the hospital. So I'm curious. Right. So. No, this isn't doing it for the hospital. We have to uh, contract with the hospital for Dr. Plotkin services because um, okay. we have uh, we need options. If, if one of our psychiatrists is treating the person that is is requiring the 730, they're exempt. That's a conflict. Right. So we have to go elsewhere. So we use no. Dr. Vos, who used to be yeah. our psychologist, but is no longer with us. We use Dr. Plotkin at CMH. Uh, and yes, there is a charge for that. Um, if they deem somebody is needing to be reconstituted, in other words, they're not able to participate in the process of defending themselves, then yes, as you, I believe you know, Rob, the, the county is on the right for that, yeah. and we get bills for that monthly by uh, by OMH. Okay, thank you. So I think I had a motion. Yeah. Second. 
Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. All right. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Well, we have the overtime report there, which you can see we're well under our uh, projected overtime budget of twelve thousand dollars. He's already spent the money someplace else. Maybe he's eyeing it up. He's got his eye on. Look at that. Any questions? I have a Thank question you, from Dan. Supervisor Musman. Yeah, it's curious. Maybe I missed it, but where, where's the wellness hub? Uh, how's that? Uh, where's that at? Uh, the latest is that. Um, you know, we are uh, we prepared a presentation for representatives from the governor's office. Uh, our uh, coordinator, Lori Torgerson, as well as Cheryl Roberts, unlikely myself, and probably a few others from the work group will be meeting with those individuals. The purpose of the meeting is to um, you know keep the initiative alive in their minds, let them know that we need their help to uh, act like a hot knife to cut through the bureaucratic red tape because some of the projects, especially the housing project that we're proposing, just as a reminder for everybody, there's three entities to the wellness hub. One is a, uh, a safe haven homeless type shelter, which is, uh, you know, single rooms for uh, men uh, and, and then family rooms, right, Bob? Uh, housing, we want, uh, you know, some sort of transitional housing for folks that have mental health issues. And then there's this welcome center, which would be a clearinghouse, a space where any community member could come. So funding those and, and uh, creating those since they're unique and they don't fit nicely and tidily into the way that the state has constructed their housing models and, and their homeless shelter models. And they have no model for the welcome center. We need the governor's office's support. And then ultimately we need their money. We need, we're going to be saying to them, listen. So when is that meeting? It hasn't been scheduled yet. We're preparing the presentation. Um, so hopefully, probably not by the end of the year because, you know, we're into the holiday season. Nobody's around. People are taking time off. I'd like to say early in the new year when everybody comes back to to work and, and, and refocuses for the new year, I think would be the best time to sit with those individuals. Thank you. Very well. Are there any other questions for Director Almasi? Are there any other matters from the committee? Are there any matters from the public? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is for um, Mr. Almasi. Um, isn't there a type of community uh, house in Poughkeepsie? And around four years ago, there was discussion there that has a transitional house that um, it was part of this community house network or in, um, where. And I was wondering how that compares to an Oxford house, something where this they were actually built um, buying a house in Poughkeepsie and trying to have what I guess one floor for people in recovery, one floor for people who were in a later stage of recovery. Hmm. Without knowing the name, I don't know which one you're talking about. There, there is Rose House, which was created specifically for folks with mental health issues. Uh -huh. um, and Danielle, do you know of this? No, without knowing the name, I'm not sure which one yeah. you're referring to. If, if you find the name, Jeanette, just call me, and then we can talk about it with your specificity. OK. Oh. And I have to reach out to my counterpart, Jean Marie, from Dutchess County. She's the director of the Yeah, because I just was wondering how it's I don't think it's redundant because if you were here, uh, Kathleen mentioned that Dutchess County has just contracted with Oxford House. They put out an RFP, Oxford, Oxford House to answer the call, and they just signed a lease on the first of, I believe, three houses that they contracted for. Thank you, Dan. Any other public comment? That being said, I ask for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Good night, everyone. Hello, everybody. I'd like to uh, start the Public Safety Committee meeting for November, November 14th, 2023. Um, the first uh, two individuals that are here, it's in reference to local law for animal abuse registry. Uh, Wendy Gunter and Linda Gunter are here. Why don't you both come up and sort of give a little presentation? I know we had a presentation once before in regards to this. Um, since then, I've met with them. This is a different group. It seems to be much more organized and, and have a lot of answers to questions. So, so let them present and then we'll vote. Okay.
<laughs> Thank you. I'm Wendy Gunter. I am with Everlasting Hope Animal Rescue. I am the president and founder of Everlasting Hope. We've been a animal rescue in Columbia County, Clawrick area for the last 11 years. This is my mom, Linda, and I forgot my glasses, so she's going to read the first part <laughs> for me. <laughs> Well, as you know, we're here to ask for your support of an animal abuse registry law in Columbia County. Thank you, Kelly, for helping us format mm -hmm. this. It did a great job. Um, and that's in everybody's packet. The first county animal abuse registry was passed in New York State in 2010. <laughs> there are currently 23 counties in New York State with registries, including Albany, Duchess, and Green. There's a list in your packet of those that are bolded on the uh, on that form. In 2015, Tennessee became the first state to adopt a statewide registry. Also in 2015, a bill was proposed in the New York Senate to establish a statewide animal abuse registry, but it was not passed. Our hope is that New York State will pass a statewide registry law at some point, which would simplify the process for shelters, rescues, and pet sellers required to check for convicted abusers. And at that time, any um, county registries would be null and void because the state registry would supersede them. Mm -hmm. So our mission statement is included. I hope you all had a chance to read it a little bit about us and what we do. Um, and the local law that Kelly helped us with in uh, Columbia County format and the New York State Humane Association list of registries. Um, this law was um, modeled after Sullivan counties. It seemed to be the simplest and the easiest to understand. I don't think you want me to read it to you. I hope if anybody has any questions, we'd be glad to, uh, to field them. Well, as far as the local law itself goes, our county attorney would review it, which he hasn't yet. So um, this would be just a matter of the committee asking questions. If the committee votes to move this forward, it would go to full board. Um, and then obviously this local law will be reviewed by the county's attorney's office. So are there any questions from, I do know though, just to step back, I do know that I, I spoke to the sheriff if he was in support of this and he was, I don't want to misspeak. Is that correct, Sheriff? Absolutely. And I, and I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, the DA's office is also um, in support of this. Yes, um, I have not spoken to the new, the, the incoming DA, but I would assume um, maybe I shouldn't assume, but I would assume that they would also be in support of this. So are there questions from the committee? I, I, I don't think we had as as much information the last time and it sort of be a little bit mumble jumbled. So um, any questions from anybody? I do a question. So I really appreciate you coming to the county with this proposal and sort of your concern for animal welfare. Uh, I really appreciate that and agree with you about how important that is. I am skeptical about the animal registry as a solution to actually reducing animal cruelty. Uh, and so I'm curious if you can sort of shed light on that. But in part, I guess from what I've read is that you can create this bureaucracy that tracks people and that requires people to sign up. But does that, is there actually any evidence that it reduces that? Um, from my research, groups like the ASPCA, which is an animal welfare organization, mm -hmm. actually don't support animal cruelty registra registries. This is like a quote from their website. It is apparent that animal abuse registries are, in, are an ineffective, potentially costly approach to preventing those convicted of animal cruelty from causing future harm to animals or people. And from the research that I saw, there's a lot of places that have registries or either very few people sign, like there's like difficulties in getting people to actually sign up. And so you get caught into this whole like punitive system of trying to make sure that people sign up. But then even if they do sign up, do they actually, is it actually the thing that we want them to do? And so, I understand the sort of desire to take action, but I am skeptical about sort of creating bureaucracies without sort of proven methods. So I'm curious if you have thoughts about that. So the goal would be is once they are on the registry and we have we're aware of that, that it would help it would make the pet stores and like PetSmart and us and the main societies so that they don't get another animal. That would be the goal, is just to have a little bit right now we don't know. We have like a DNA uh, I do not adopt Hudson Valley Facebook page that somebody created that we add stuff to, but to go back three years on that page trying to find a name, there's really no way to search that effectively. So the goal would be is to try not to put an animal back into somebody's hands that has been an abuser. I mean, we can 
there's a lot of it doesn't work you know the whole sex offender registry if they're told to come in and register you hope that they do if they move from another state we've also had that issue with things like that you know the judge from another state could say you have to register if they move to new york what's the tracking there so we do hope that if we work together as a community to make this work that it just will prevent hopefully some people we can't we're not going to save the world but we're just making them a little bit more public like they do with the sex offender registry um to make sure that we're we're held responsible we're making more work for ourselves with this registry and for pet stores it is going to be a little bit more work because we're going to have to go through that and make sure so that would be our goal is to not give an animal that somebody's previously abused to back it's also a public public information so even if it's not just the agencies that would check it but i mean you could check on your neighbor if you suspect that they have pets that they're not taking care of you can look and see if they're on the registry you can be on the horn to call and report them if you think that things are not going well and it, it's not going to prevent people from going on um craigslist and, and finding something that somebody's given away because it's if somebody wants to get an animal they're going to be able to do it but we feel strongly, and again, like Wendy said, it's going to be a lot more work for us to check this every time we get an application. But if we can prevent even some re repeat abusers from, from doing that because they can't get new pets from the easiest place, um, then it's, I think it's worth it. It's, so and the more, you, the more, uh, I'm sorry. No, no. So the question I have is somebody gets charged with one of those crimes and they get convicted how does it then get to the sheriff's department on that registry what is the process well that would be something i would work with the sheriff with on from the court to almost like when a sex offender gets out they have to file that paperwork within so many days with the local law enforcement they have to report and then we would take the picture and we would upload that information so it'd be sent hopefully from the court as well as a sheet from the sheriff's department that we would be when you say we, who? Um, the the court would hopefully send it to the sheriff's department. So it would have to be really working pretty diligently with the DA's office uh, because they would be the ones that would be in the court mm -hmm. when somebody's convicted mm -hmm. and then to make sure that that paperwork absolutely. then goes from the all sorts town court to the exactly. sheriff's department. So they absolutely would have to be on board. Otherwise, there's going to be that. Yeah, and, and it would be something i mean it would depend on what the charge is but if the da felt that that was a charge that this should they should be put onto the registry then yes the paperwork would flow that way and then it would be up to the sheriff's department to get them all set and put them on the website and have our database with them i assume um you know this only relates to dogs but that you've had conversations with different dog control officers or we work very close with Kyle, who I think is the dog control officer in almost every county, in every town right now. Well, we have Maggie, Maggie Bagger. Okay. We have talked to, we, we've worked with Kyle closely, um, and he is very, the flow of communication between us and the Humane Society and Kyle has been very good. So hopefully mm -hmm. that will continue, but we were very willing to work with anyone there to help out. The only reason I bring that up is that, and that was per, per, prior to Maggie, but we had some situations where, you know, dogs were really mistreated mm -hmm. and, you know, when they were removed from the household and uh, actually on a couple of occasions. And, you know, it's just, it's horrible that, you know, when you got 50 dogs in a house and, you know, not, you know they start eating on each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff, you would have a link on your website that would have this registry on it, I assume, so the public yeah. could access it. We would. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about a data driven society now. Any information we can get to help us lead to successful prosecution provide us more evidence in any case. We have animal cruelty investigators in the house as a sheriff's office. Uh, it would be a great tool for them to have. Um, and we can't have 100% favor. Any other questions? No, I think it's a I think it's a great idea if it deters one okay. case from happening okay. what does it hurt so i mean i'd like to move this through the county attorney for review i have a second so go ahead question yeah. so um first of all i know you folks and i know your organization we've met before um so th these are these are things i'm mm -hmm. thinking about one is i uh, i think it would be interesting 
whoever would do this research to find out what the answer is to, to the question is how effective these laws are. And if they are effective, it, it seems to me to be the ideal that it should really be a statewide law. Why did you say you tried it in the state? Oh, we, that's we not us. Um, um, that was in 2015. That was. A bill was months. presented and it just didn't go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm but one, we're willing to, to yeah, go yeah. that route too. <laughs> and we're also seeing success with other counties, like Sullivan County, yeah. even Green County. You have to think that Green County was just passed a year and a half ago. Yeah. I, I mean, if we think if if in fact there is evidence that it really does work, then if it does work, then it seems to me a statewide solution, and maybe to talk to state representatives would be worthwhile. As far as this law, the one that we're looking at, see, I think that everybody around this table will absolutely agree that we want to do whatever we can to save to, to, to save every little dog. So by the way, two weeks ago, my little dog had surgery, emergency surgery, because they had a bladder stone. Mm -hmm. So I understand how important this is. I thought I would die. <laughs> um, he's fine. <laughs> and he's not peeing in the house anymore. So so when I look at this law though, I think I really think that before it goes any further, it really should be reviewed by the county attorney and then come back to us. This is, this is what I'm thinking. For instance, there's section three F. So you can be a deemed an animal abuser if you're if you're found guilty of any one of those enumerated crimes, but also if you were charged with one of those enumerated crimes, but were found guilty or pled guilty to something else, probably pled guilty. Is mm -hmm. So in other words, if someone was overcharged and they weren't actually guilty of the top count, but they pled guilty to something else benign, like a domestic that, that disorderly, case, conduct. disorderly conduct, right? Mm -hmm. And that they really, there really was no proof and they really didn't, but because they were originally charged for whatever reasons, um they would be subject to these are pretty severe penalties to have your name Absolutely. and your uh, your photograph and your date of birth so i mean i think it would be not only would it be wrong and probably unconstitutional to penalize a person who was actually not guilty who was only accused but also would subject the county to liability if we're plastering people's pictures on a website and then later on, somebody sues us and said, I, I was never guilty of that. I, I never pled guilty to that. I was never found guilty of that. And I'm being penalized in my, you know, I've lost my job. I've lost, you know. So, so I mean, I think that kind of thing. There's another, yeah. there's another sm smaller thing that um, if you can't afford the fee, then it, probably there should be a third neutral party. I don't know who would make that decision whether or not you were, you were really indigent and you couldn't afford it. It probably shouldn't be the same agency that's collecting the money to, to make the decision that you don't have to pay. So, I mean, I think that there's things like that um, well, that I, should be should be addressed before it comes back to this committee and or to the board of supervisors. We would really, really need the DA to kind of help out with that because you are right. You charge with what you initially see and then it can be proven in the court of law that you didn't commit that crime or you should have not been charged with that original right. and you know we're going to take it down to maybe what it right. should have been or you just don't have any criminal history so you get pled down to disorderly conduct or harassment instead of maybe the assault or something that you should have been that if you might have really committed that assault right. but you didn't have any prior so it gets taken down to harassment that would be up to the da if the da felt there was enough to charge but since this person didn't have any criminal history and they didn't feel that they were a flight risk and all these other things and they put it down to a lower count then the DA should say yes. Then they should remain on the reg be on the registry, or they're going to say, "Hey, listen, there wasn't. Enough, you guys did not provide enough evidence to have this um, that charge. So we're going to charge with this, and then they shouldn't be on the registry." 100. So how about I make a suggestion that we we vote as a group to move the local law forward, not to the full board yet, though, which means to get it to the county attorney's office to rewrite this. We can send comments if you'd like. Bring it back to our committee make sure we're comfortable with it and then we can vote to move it forward so this is it. really a motion to refer to the county attorney right right right, 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 right. review that. and bring review it back to us to to uh look through this local law again uh we'll have a larger group here at that point in time 
This way, at least you are moving this along. We've been talking about this for quite some time. We won't bring it to full board. It'll come back to us. better law than we looked at before. Correct, but yeah. but I realize there's some more que tweaks that you'd like to see yeah, right. on it, and also the county attorney hasn't even looked at it. Right. right. Can I ask you one more question? Please. Sure, please. So I don't know <clears throat> if this is right for New York State. The ASPCA, what they recommend is they say that when people are paroled, that database is public already. So when people are under parole, and they're released. That's a public database. And what they recommend is that judges just put a no contact order as part of the parole. And then you just make the no contact orders as part of the public research database. So they, this, this recommendation is not about New York State. So I don't know for sure if it would work in New York State. But what they're saying is that there's already a mechanism where judges where, where judges can decide, I think there should be a no contact order with animals, which in some ways is I think it's more meaningful to have a judge just say you can or can't be around an animal rather than trying to like enforce it through this registry bureaucracy. But that the registry in essence already exists. There's already a parole registry. And so you could just attach it to that. So but you don't the, need all this. Excuse me, but the only issue with that is parole is only through county court and only through if somebody was convicted of a felony and went to jail. So if 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 it said probation and and or parole, I would feel a little more comfortable right. because that means every local court, nobody's on parole. Right. So okay. um you know, I mean, but again, those types of things in here, the verbiage, if you'd like to see them, I think we can tweak this. I mean, we're not in a rush. Right. I mean, I guess what the ASB, ASB is saying is that, like, you can just use the parole, parole probation mechanisms. Right. You don't need the separate registry. So, like, I don't know enough about how New York State or Columbia County works to know that's true. But in essence, if that's, I guess my question would be is why not, why not that, which seems way simpler in using existing mechanisms rather than creating a separate bureaucracy. <laughs> well, there wouldn't be a way. question is why not this? There wouldn't be a way for people who <clears throat> adopt or sell these pets to know that someone has a history. I guess they're saying, it, the ASBC is saying that information is public, would be public, so anybody could still look it up. Um, I guess the reason why I think it's preferred is some of the things that you were mentioning around cost, right? Is that you, the risk of saying, okay, somebody commits oh, a horrible crime, but also they can do their time, they can be rehabilitated. And then 20 years later, they like don't register, or they move, they can actually go to jail you could actually be sent to jail for up to a year just for like failing to follow the bureaucracy. So like their crime was not that they committed. But in this in this registry that we're talking about, there is no crime that's applicable to this, is there? There's a punishment if you don't follow the registry. There was, I crime. think that there was the, that up, to the year up to a year, yeah. So like, I mean, for in this is in perpetuity. So it's like for a period of seven years and then and we can tweak that. We actually change that. So again, you know, the county attorney may come back with, he may hate this, and he may say, I don't like it, and or make some changes. We can make comments, right. and then it would have to come back in front of our committee and, and vote, you know, to go to full board anyway. So at, at this point, I'm just saying, I think it's a good concept. I understand a lot of the concerns, and we're not putting it to full board for, for, um, for a vote. We'll bring it back to the committee. We can have more discussion on it. At that, least this gets this moving in, in a direction that I think most people would like with some changes. Most of this speaking. Just briefly right. back to the question of is it proven that it works? I don't know how that would that would be trapped because if an organization like ours found somebody on the registry and did not adopt to them when they applied, did it work? Yeah, we don't check a box. Yeah. You know, d does that mean it worked because we didn't adopt an animal when they applied for one? How do we know how many times somebody looks up someone on the registry and doesn't give them the animal that they're looking for to possibly prevent something from happening? So this this would also help in, in, for, with local breeders. A local breeder is not going to go to the court system and foil and look to see if Joe John Smith, you know, has any convictions. But they may say, look, I'm selling Labrador pups. I can go to the Columbia County website and see if John Smith is on there. Right. At least that gives me some level of 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 security that i'm selling it to at least but not a known individual that's on that but you know it's not it's it's pretty onerous to get records for people and people won't just go do that so this is a registry that's easily accessible for the public i think that's that's a, a, a important point that's right. all and not everybody that commits a crime in this manner and some of these are going to end up on solar probation so some a lot of those would fall through the cracks. Yeah, these are misdemeanors, so they're not yeah. going to be on parole. So that's one and of the or other. violations. <laughs> right. So if they just get you know one of the charges that they just do, 
you know, to the court, then we're not going to have that information. So is the committee comfortable with that, or? I would move that we refer it to the county attorney for yeah. review. Okay. Right. Second on that. I was going to say, we ready to head. We're going to move the second. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carried. So we, we may bring you back and ask Absolutely. you, but at least now it'll go to the county attorney. Okay, thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, it'll be a little bit, yeah. yeah. No problem. And if there's any other questions, yeah. Kelly knows how to reach out to us. That's great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great thank night. You. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you. 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 Good seeing you. Thank you. I Does anybody Florida. know whose pocketbook this it's is? Claire's. It's Claire's. Claire's. Oh, okay. She was here and she okay. left. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I was going to say, I text her. Like two right. hours ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mr. Keeler. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the accommodation and giving me up in the I appreciate that. Uh, he didn't even know he did it. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we had Kelly. Yeah, yeah, Kelly, right. Right. Yeah, Kelly. Thank God. Thank God. Uh, first of all, I just want to commend the Gunters for all the work they've done here in this county, trying to represent yeah. her. Had some and take care of them. They've done a tremendous job over there. So good for them. Uh, I have a resolution request to uh, renew or not to renew to have a new contract with Fitch and Associates. We do our EMS study for it just for on a consulting basis. It'll be on a per hour basis. Uh, I do have a put it in the budget for night like, for 2024 at $5,000. Uh, we will actually rely on them to help us uh, with some guidelines and performance standards, so on and so forth. And so I just have a question on yep. this, PJ. I spoke to Matt about it earlier. He and I discussed this. You know, we, we got these two reports, right? We got the one for EMS. We got one for um, fire companies. We spent, I'm going to say $80,000. They were 40 something and 40 something. So the, the fire uh, coordinator, George, is not here. We're going to meet with him and decide what, you know, what, what are the next action plans for that, right? I don't want to spend forty or fifty thousand dollars on a report and then, well, what are we doing with it? And we do know that the EMS report you're working on that aspect of it, but we don't have anybody working on the other. So what would be the what would be the reasoning at this point that we would need to consult with them? Um, the yeah, reason, for what? Yeah, the reason to consult with them would it be how to implement some of these action reports. Okay. Okay. And and working with like Rob Fitzsimmons and our contract that we have with the agencies in implementing some of the performance standards that we should be incorporating into the contract. And this is what they do. So it's it's not a lot of for work. them to help us bring it to the finish line. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Come. I'll move it. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And I will okay. say, if I could, that you know, we're bringing this to the finish line, but in terms of the firematics, yeah. we're just starting that process. Yeah. Correct. Right. So, yep. Yeah. Great. And this really isn't part of that. It's right. separate. Yeah, right. it's separate. So uh again i sent out an overview the uh, proposed solutions that we presented to the ms advisory board uh put it in a written structure so that you could all see the direction that we're trying to head and also put it in a written form so they could take it back to their board of directors so that there's one form of communication and it's not just hearsay and innuendo and what if and so on and so forth so Again, I'm not going to, uh, you know, reiterate any of this, but basically to address, trying to address the major points that were brought out in the study. Obviously, finance is one. Uh, accountability for the taxpayer money is another one. Uh, patient care is a third. And how do we keep the system alive and moving forward? So that's what this kind of addresses. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we did go back and come up with some statistical information. I know, Michael, you had, excuse yeah. me, Supervisor Trees had requested, um, you know, why should Hudson participate because, you know, they're so close to the hospital. But you'll see some from some of the statistical information uh, right there, okay? In 2022, you'll see that ambulances moved around the county covering for each other 3,742 times, okay? Mm -hmm. 10 times a day. We're moving ambulances around uh, for areas that are depleted. Um, That's about this, yeah. those numbers. So like that, those numbers, those are the times that 
a company helped someone else or a company needed help? No, help someone else. Okay. In other words, let's just say Greenport, the resources are depleted, okay? They would move to, uh, Galatia would come down to, or uh, Copic would come to Route 9H and 23, or Galatia would come down to the airport, so on and so forth, okay, to help cover that area. So these are times when agencies uh, move to cover for each other. And, and then the county, the county then reimburses, like when that happens, yes. the county pays an additional. Correct. So like a, a company gets, it has its municipal contracts that it gets paid from, and then it yeah. also has a contract. It also gets paid from the county right. for those when it moves over. That's correct. Okay. Thank yep. you. And that's part of the mm -hmm. budget process. Right. Okay. okay. In 2023, uh, that's again, year to date through October 29th. So we're still on track to go about this thing. <laughs> Um, next figure or next uh, statistic, Kelly, if you would please. Okay, these are the number of EMS calls handled by when these agencies move. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's the total there. Uh, I did identify there's always been a discussion of NDP, okay, because it was brought out in a Fitch report that we need to do something uh, to work with NDP to try to enhance their coverage or otherwise to do something else. So this is a statistical report that shows that, you know, about 20 some percent of the times we as a county are covering our calls versus all the other agencies. So mm -hmm. I have met with uh, Mark Brown from NDP and uh, it's a discussion to be continued. So, but as we move forward, uh, hopefully we can address some of these issues to, uh, to bring that number down. <clears throat> The only thing I will tell you, PJ, yep. one of the board members from one of the boards said they, they've gotten no information yet. So that's why I put it in writing. I sent it out to each agency and good. said, please pass along your board members. Good, because they had said, you know, yep. we don't we have we don't know. So I and think you would probably heard that's that. Why. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very good. This is great. Thank Working you. Progress. Okay. Any questions? Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, yep. Sheriff. Evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I don't know how to get to the top of it. You're second. I'm not going to complain. You're second. I'm not going to complain. Yeah. You were first, but then PJ pushed yeah, you out of the way. You're not first, you're last. Right? Uh, so, uh, the first resolution is to authorize the sheriff's office to fill a vacant budget full time right. deputy sheriff's position. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So carried. Thank you. Authorization for Sheriff's House to fill a full time corrections officer position. Hold it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So carried. The third resolution is to authorize uh, authorization to create and fill three special patrol deputy positions that will move us from 15 special patrol deputies to 18. Can I get more tickets from Germany? <laughs> no, no, if, if you say yes, I'll, I'll move it. <laughs> I can't go in good yeah, conscience. I know, I know. Yes, yeah, we can. I'm okay. So, um, I was just going to say about the salary is nineteen fifty to twenty three dollars. Correct. Uh, that seems That's uh, these are yeah. part time uh, deputy sheriffs. Uh, they're governed by civil service, and and they only have certain areas where they can work. Uh, most of the time, it's in the security services buildings. Uh, town courts, town meetings, uh, and public domains. I'll move it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carry. We'll save us on overtime, too. Because yeah. right now you have regular deputies who are covering. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Um, the uh, final resolution is uh, authorization to accept the 20 more <laughs> three. Thank you. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Okay, you gotta be quick to beat Ray. I know. I just want to let you. I saw Grant. He went move it. <laughs> Any questions for the sheriff? Just have the uh, out of county inmate report. Uh, I, I, can... <laughs> I didn't. Put it, I didn't scan it. I apologize. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. I can. Uh, you want to copy this? Oh, no, I've got it. Like, oh, you have a website. Yeah. For some reason, I didn't make my screen. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So uh, <laughs> through October 2023, we received four thousand six hundred eighty dollars from Franklin County, thirteen thousand two hundred dollars from Greene County, Ulster County, uh, two thousand six hundred thirty-five. Uh, the total for September 2023 is 20,515. Year to date, uh, 2023 is 
Uh, previous uh, 2020 was 124,515. The uh, Metler report is uh, 40 incarcerated uh, as of today, five, five from Greene County, one from Ulster, and two from Franklin. You know, this is my last public safety committee. So I'm kind of touched. I think we should refer to that as the Metler report. Yeah, thank what you. do you think? We will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you're yeah. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, three resolutions for you. <laughs> First one uh, request authorization to accept. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? So carried. Second yeah. one, request authorization to accept the 23 PSAP grant total in 159 seconds. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carries. Third resolution I have uh, pertains to our photo credentialing system that we do for mostly fire, EMS, and we do a couple various agencies. We were doing Germantown School and a couple of the county agencies that come to us. Uh, me green mental health association but but the importance of it is on the credentialing side is for the fire service we offer color codes based upon if you're an interior firefighter or not so it, it's, it displays green for a while uh hudson would go to green county they had a salamander's white in policy which was stopped but we had we accommodated the just element of our code as well um the system's been in play for a long time. In fact, the software is installed on a computer that has Windows NT uh, operating system. So if anybody knows about computers, it's very old. It's actually ready to fall on its face. So what I'm asking for is a request to replace that uh, with Windstar uh, using their state OGS code for an amount not to exceed $11,896.55. It's not just for the system. It's also supplies as well that we again we give out to the fire service and usually when we get the uh you know when we provide that we don't that charge them um, otherwise we're just charging for services in this resolution request uh authorization to amend the 23 adopted budget just to move uh the equipment or the the dollar amount from one account to the other I'll move it. second all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed so carried first thing i have is the agency data for october uh our income and call volume for October was 3,507 calls. We dispatched 1,376 EMS agencies, 339 fire agencies, 1,719 police polls, and 430 public service calls. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zona? <laughs> Evening. Next, have uh, one personnel. Move it. Thank you. Second. You all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Thank you. Thanks. And the fire coordinator, uh, emergency management. <laughs> How are you, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our activity, and uh, also we have two very good. Tabletop exercise, we talked a little bit last month about the cyber attack exercise, which I came out of um, feeling that our MIS department is, is headed in a very good direction. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. I will say that this team that comes down and does this for New York State, it's the cyber response team, was impressed that we had three supervisors attend. The supervisor, lots of the supervisors from Ken were both on the uh, IT uh, committee and also the chairman of the board, which I don't think they've ever hmm. had happen. So Kelly may be here. <laughs> <laughs> and not an active shooter, tabletop exercise in Germantown that went very well. We just met with uh, the hospital. They're requesting an exercise that we'll be doing. Uh, we'll start planning for it soon, but it won't happen until the spring. And I'd like to thank the supervisor for your service. Oh, and, uh, hmm. all your input I enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah. Everything you've done as supervisor on the committees. 
Should have took two wow. years, Press right? record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you. The COVID years were tough, right? Yeah. That was your first. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It took quite a time. But, <laughs> yeah. but I guess there's always, there's never a really good time. easy time, right? Anymore. But, good questions. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And fire. Fire coordinator is here. He's not here. And he's looking to reappoint Steve Monti from the uh, Stuyvesant Fire Department, representing battalions four and five. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Anything from the committee? Is there one more? There's one more. One more. Okay. Yeah. One more. Yeah. 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 Ramos, New Lebanon, and oh, Linda, sorry. Ron, Kanan. For DM positions as fire instructor to be used. Oh, yeah, sorry. Second it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? So carried. Anything else from the committee? Anything from the public? I would also like to thank Jeannie for serving on our committee and being my co chair, and you will be missed. And thank you very much for your service. You should have made her do this meeting. Oh, well, I right. made, made her. <laughs> I'm not sure she wanted it. She's a genius. She's a genius. She's a genius. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us this year.